we've got Marika uh, Fragaki as well, who's an economist, member of the Syriza Political Secretariat, and he's in charge of uh, economic. She's in charge in economic policy, and now I'll give the floor to Marika Frangaki. Thank you very much for inviting me uh, to uh, uh, participate here from Syriza. Uh, in today's meeting. I didn't actually know that we were going to have interpretation today, so I'll be speaking English because I've prepared my uh, presentation in English, so apologies. Okay, I just said that um, not being aware that there would be translators, I interpreters, I have prepared my presentation in English, and here I go. This is the outline. Um, I shall have to, be, to go fast through all these points. Uh, basically, I'm going to talk about the role of the ECB in the handling of the crisis. I am not going to spend time, like uh, my colleague did uh, on, on the Irish case, on implications of the crisis. By now, uh, the Greek crisis is about the most talked, sort of, uh, talked about area, so I assume that much of that is already known. Um, so, this is where it all started, in the financial markets. The... Um, Greek government bonds, 10-year government bonds uh, spreads over the German 10-year gov uh, government bond went wild at the uh, – well, it started going up um, as soon as the financial crisis began, but it was, you know, mildly do going up. And then uh, as uh, various uh, events happened, uh, the Greek statistics case at the end of the 2009 and then 2010, people started wondering what's going to happen next. So you have this steep, impressively steep rise in, in the spreads, which was a sign of the financial uh, crisis, the, the Greek debt crisis beginning. So we come to May 2010, and the first adjustment program, that's a loan, granted on market rates. That was one way of penalizing the Greek governments for being lax. And um, it is uh, strictly conditional on the implementation of severe austerity measures uh, to be disbursed, the loan to be disbursed in tranches, which, which is the carrot and the stick method that is still uh, applied. And um, so what was the role of the ECB in, in the uh, first adjustment program? Well, first of all, uh, to, to, uh, the 2nd of May, the um, uh, governing council of the ECB welcomed the uh, program that was uh, approved, that was um, approved. Approved is um, a misnomer. In fact, it was uh, the Greek government accepted uh, following the successful, this, this is the kind of uh, Euro speak, following the successful conclusion of the negotiations in liaison with the ECB and the IMF, modestly placed in liaison. We still don't know what in liaison means because it also came up in the third adjustment program and the European stability mechanism. So, uh, on the 2nd of May, the ECB appears to be happy with the, uh, adjustment pro the first adjustment program. And on the 10th of May, it announced the um, Securities Market Program, which was the predecessor of the quantitative easing uh, program. And um, in other words, the purchase of government bonds in secondary markets. Uh, it was in operation until 2012, and the main concern is to protect the European banks. It's not to save the Greek uh, uh, public debt crisis, it's to save the European banks, which were given the opportunity to, to unload the Greek government bonds onto the ECB. And you can see that in this graph. Uh, in fact, you have to look very hard. It's the tiny blue bits right at the bottom, which is the Greek government bonds owned by various European banks. As you can see, the main problem there is, of course, Spain and Italy. And uh, so, in fact, the IMF in, in a report in 2013 was very clear about this, that the, what was done in 2010, the measures that were taken, had to do with saving the European banks, not the Greek case. And Varoufakis, in his usual uh, clear way, put it forward, you know, uh, this being a scandal. And we come to the second adjustment program, the second memorandum. You see, by 2000. And 12, it was clear that the focus made in the first program 
were widely wrong. They were completely uh, sort of uh, overtaken by reality. So although a decline of 4% of GDP uh, by 4% in 2010 and 25 2011 was forecast, in fact, it ran into 5.3 and 89.9, nearly 9%. That was, those were the years when you have uh, a, a, a impressive and very quick uh, fall in, in, in all the Greek economic indicators. Uh, and therefore, what do we do about this? Well, a new loan. A new loan with additional austerity measures and priority given to our debtor, the, uh, our creditors, the, uh, Greece's creditors. Uh, at that time, the New Democracy and the PASOK leaders actually sent letters uh, saying that no, ma no matter what happens in Greece, we are responsible for the implementation of this program. Uh, the D PSI, one of the previous speakers did refer to the PSI, the private sector involvement, which is another name for debt restructuring. Uh, that is the uh, exchanging the Greek government bonds by other bonds which at, at about half the price. It affected about 30% of the debt and it was paid out from the second adjustment program, the second loan. The public debt ratio did decline only in one year in 2012 and, and started rising again as of the next year. So what was the role of the ECB in the second adjustment program? Well, at that time, remember, the securities market program had been running, which means that the ECB had been acquiring Greek bonds from the European banks that were unloading, that were uh, take, getting money out of the ECB and giving Greek bo bonds, as well as Spanish, Italian, and so uh, bonds as um, uh, collateral. Now, at that time, the ECB claimed its senior creditor status, like quasi-IMF status. It said that... The ECB bonds come first. If, if anything happens, uh, uh, if, if uh, a, um, a data ha ha meets with, comes into problems, then they have to pay off the ECB first, like they, do, they would have to do with the IMF. And, of course, seniority is a source of instability. It is, Paul de Graaf has uh, argued this very clear, in very clear terms. So there you go. Again, the ECB contravening its basic mandate, which is price stability. And you can see that in these graphs. Well, all you have to notice, it concerns the Italian and the Spanish bonds, two-year and five-year, and, and, and the German bonds. And as you can see, the spikes, the colored spikes, are the Italian and the, the uh, uh, Spanish bonds. And you have, between 2010 and 2012, the ECB is simply failing quite clearly in carrying out its main role, which is to bring about financial stability. That is, that is its role. That's what a central bank is about. So at that time, the, uh, Draghi comes forward with his do-whatever-it-takes pledge. That is supposed to have calmed down the financial markets. The main point about the OMT program is that it was limitless. It was whatever it takes, no limit, no upper limit, whereas the security markets program did have a limit. It was, you know, so many billion euro were prepared to spend on this. But it was tied to very strict conditionalities again. Uh, I've, I've put down the four main conditionalities right at the bottom of the slide, which is A, the existence of an adjustment program. That is, economic restructuring, fiscal consolidation, and so on and so forth. What we heard about the Irish case, ditto in the Greek case. So first of all, you have the existence of an adjustment program. Secondly, satisfactory compliance. Now, what does that mean? If it, unemployment is going up and up and up, is that satisfactory compliance? But the public deficit and the public debt is probably coming down a bit. So satisfactory compliance. Gaining access to bond markets. That's a bit, a little clearer. Although you have to be trading under stress. So these are the four conditionalities, which are clear where it is, it, it is good for the financial markets, but vague when it comes to what it actually means in, 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 in uh, uh, social terms. Now, by 2012, uh, the, the OMT uh, program was announced in 2012, and it went on to 2015. I should say that the... Um, The, 
The sorry, I, I'm sort of looking at my notes. The uh, the OMT was nev never actually was put into effect. It was never put into effect. It didn't have the, it, it, calmed, it did calm the, the financial markets down a bit. It was not put into effect. However, it, it paved the way, I think it's further down, but I'm going to say it now. It paved the way for the QE, for the quantitative easing exercise, which was to follow in, in uh, last year in legal terms. Um, what we have there is a graph which shows the main concern, the shift in concern of the ECB. The ECB was mainly concerned about contagion in the financial markets. In other words, since there is risk, credit risk um, underlying the Greek government bonds, that spreads on to the Irish, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the Italian bonds. So you have this kind of spiky um, appearance of the financial markets as, 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 as uh, yields go up and down widely and you have bro uh, widening spreads. Now, by, two th uh, by 2014, there is a shift in the main concern of the ECB because although it's been failing in carrying out its mandate, which is financial stability, it, this is reflected in another failure, which is clearer to the man in, and the woman in the street, which is that uh, inflation is not just around 2%, which is the main mandate of the ECB, to keep it there. But it's falling down to 1% and less than 1%. The graph up there shows the um, uh, consumer prices uh, in, in 2012 to 2015. And you can see that it's been going, it's very erratic and the general trend is downwards. This is why the, the, the uh, ECB is uh, getting worried about this, there's the shift, and this is the principle behind the quantitative easing. By this time, the failure of the ECB to carry out its mandate is, has become clearer even to the ECB. Basically, it goes, it uh, again takes up, uh, uh, introduces a number of measures. I think one of the previous speakers mentioned that. The, it reduces its key rates uh, to very low uh, levels, uh, uh, rates, and in fact, nowadays you have a, a bank that would like to deposit its money uh, with the ECB, it will have to pay. It, there's, there's, there's a charge for that. So, basically what that means is that the banks are in a, the, the economy is in a liquidity trap. In other words, the, the banks would rather hold the, sit on the money hold the, 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 the reserves with the uh, central bank rather than uh, lend. And, and this is the main problem today with the uh, Euro Eurozone economies. So the ECB has uh, introduced the quantitative easing uh, program, the asset purchase program. In various forms, that has been around for some time. However, it's the public assets uh, purchase uh, program which is the new element in it. As I said earlier, the uh, ONT program did pave the way for the uh, uh, public, pur uh, public purchase program in legal terms. The OMT was challenged by, the, by German MPs in the German Constitutional, Federal Constitutional Court, and which referred it to the European Court uh, of Justice, which ruled that, yes, the OMT is okay. You can carry on. You can do it. It's within your mandate. Um, it was the asset public purchase program was announced in, 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 uh, on the 22nd of January. On the 25th, there were elections in Greece, and Syriza became government, uh, uh, won the elections, and together with Enel, it formed a government. Now, on the 22nd of January, it, the ECB announced that they were going to spend 60 billion every month buying assets. Uh, mainly out of that, by the end of 2015, 650 billion had been spent, of which 75.5% went on the purchase of public assets, that is government bonds, in the secondary market. That is important to note. It is, they don't buy, the ECB does not buy uh, assets, government bonds in the primary, when they are issued, the primary market, because that is supposed to be uh, monetization, they do buy it on, in the secondary market. Uh, 
Germ and of course, since this, this, these amounts are uh, distributed on a pro rata basis depending on the size of the member states, the big member states get the lion's share. Uh, as you can see there, Germany, France and Italy have got uh, between them more than half. As a result, the ECB balance sheet is expanding forever. This is a kind of debt monetization, right? This is a kind of increasing, but the, 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 the handling of the new money is, goes through the financial markets, what we heard earlier. It is not through the budget, the public budget, it's through the financial markets, and of course it favors those who play on those markets, the financial institutions, the wealthy who own those assets, and so on and so forth. Um, so, let's go back to the Greek case again, after this short kind of parenthesis on the ECB, and you can see there that since 2009, the uh, Syriza, the radical left, uh, Alliance has jumped from 4.6, it was, in 2000, the, uh, um, uh, October, I think it was, uh, 2009 elections, to 36%. Uh, in January, 35.5%. Last September, it has formed a government today with, uh, with the independent Greeks, uh, 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 center-right, rightish uh, group, and uh, it's in government. Uh, On the 27th of January, the nego negotiations marathon started. If we go back just a minute ago, the 22nd, the ECB announced that we'll be spending 60 billion every month buying assets. On the 27th, you have a new government, and the new government enters into negotiations with the creditors. The new government is, in a sense, trapped because the second adjustment program had already expired, but it had been extended for technical reasons to the end of February, which was very tight schedule, especially by comparison to the repayment schedule, which was really quite demanding. The um, Greek government at that time was seeking a mutually beneficial agreement that will set realistic goals and so on and so forth. That seems to be... Uh, with hindsight, this is, that was very optimistic. Referendum, the, there's a resounding no to the proposals, and then in the end there is uh, the new, uh, uh, the third adjustment program, and uh, I've put up a quote by Tsipras on the 14th of uh, July. The 13th was the big, the 17-hour uh, meeting with the uh, Eurogroup, and, uh, which resulted in the third adjustment program, and the 14th, Tsipras has said in, in very clear terms that the result of the Euro Summit was the result of a strong pressure on a country which had expressed uh, its will to, uh, uh, to run itself democratically. But this, is, this satisfies the more financially powerful countries in Europe. That is the truth. One of the earlier speakers said that it was one against everyone else. And unfortunately, that is uh, 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 the political balance of power game that we have to take into account very clearly, in very clear terms. So, we come to the third adjustment program, a new loan, yet another loan uh, given, provided, of which, as you can see, 63 plus uh, about 29, that's 92 percent, goes back to the Greek banks and the creditors. Uh, Again, conditional on further fiscal consolidation, the recapitalization of the Greek banks, structural institutional reforms, privatization. Now, at that time, you, what you can see here is two areas that uh, were important at that time in the banking system, which is a flight of deposits that began, as you can see, that graph goes, starts from January 2010 and goes on to uh, October 2015. And you can see how the political uncertainty, which is created by the, all this setup, the, the, the political institutional setup, uh, reflects on depositors and their preparedness to leave their money with the banks or to take the money out. And that is one of the uh, points that creates a crisis in the banking system. So, uh, so you have a flight of deposits on the one hand, 
And on the other hand, you have a continuous rise in non-performing loans. Part of that is due to the uh, fall in GDP and the fall in incomes, uh, and part of that is due to the uncertainty. And we come to the role of the ECB in 2015, that is only last year, and is it a guard, was it a guardian of stability, as its role should be, or was it an enforcer of the creditors? I believe that it was an enforcer of the creditors. It took a number of measures uh, which, in fact, uh, worsened the asphyxiation of the banking system that is, in a sense, depicted in the previous two graphs. So, on the 4th of February, 25th, 22nd announces the QE, 25th there are Greek elections, 27th you have a new Greek government. On the 4th of February, the ECB announced uh, the lifting of the waiver of minimum credit rating requirements for Greek government bonds, shifting banks to the ELA, the Emergency Liquidity Assistance, which is uh, handled by the national central banks, not the ECB, that is, the credit risk is transferred to the national system. And that is important to bear in mind. On the 26th of June, uh, after the July referendum was announced, the ECB froze the amount of funding available to the Greek banks via the ELA, which is one, what one of the previous speakers said. On the one hand, is it legal to grant it? And if it is, is it legal to take it away? So we have questions of that kind coming up. And of course, on the 6th of July, it imposed a haircut on the Greek government bonds Nobody knows how much it was, but I agree it was more than 50%. It was around 50, about 55%. Um, so, of course, the flight of deposits, there's a uh, run on the banks. Paul de Grau is very clearly said that, again, I'm quoting Paul de Grau because he has uh, uh, put things in, in clear terms. The objectives of the ECB were political. They were not to uh, monetary sort of policy concerns. Where do we stand now? The Greek banks were stress-tested and recapitalized by the end of last year. The unsecured deposits were not bailed in, over 100,000 euro. They were not bailed in, although the bondholders, senior and junior bondholders, were bailed in. The government contribution eventually t turned out to be less than 6 billion as opposed to the 25 billion which was budgeted in the third loan. The ELA funding has come down to 77 billion by November, last November. And um, the uh, waiver of minimum credit rating requirements, in other words, uh, the, the uh, requirement in order to get, come out of the ELA mechanism and to go back to uh, uh, ECB funding has not been uh, satisfied. Draghi is said, said this is, it's still too early to reinstate a waiver. Uh, Athens would have to first comply and show strong ownership. Very clear political uh, statement by Draghi there. Capital controls which were introduced at the end of June are still on. They have been relaxed a lot, but they're still there. Uh, the Greek economy is in a de deflationary spiral. It started in late 2013 and it's still there. And the uh, uh, ECB would have to reinstate the waiver uh, that I mentioned just a minute ago to abolish the haircut and to return the profits made on the securities market program, which it has not been doing, and to admit the Greek government bonds to it, it, its quantitative easing program. The, these are the minimum kind of requirements of the here and now situation that would need to be satisfied for, for, for the Greek economy to take a breather. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marika. Uh, uh, we've uh, heard a lot of figures. Uh, she explained a lot of tables to us. Uh, uh, many examples were given. From uh, what she told us, uh, there are two or three things that uh, I've noted. Uh, the first thing is that it was the first program applied in Greece which rejected the uh, proposals of a technocrat, say even technocrats uh, from the IMF, uh, for a, uh, a haircut uh, of the unsustainable Greek debt because the basic uh, uh, point of the first program was to save 
the interest of the French and German banks. Uh, they uh, wanted to offload uh, Greek government bonds uh, and the title of the first memorandum was Saving the European Banks, mainly the French and German Bank. And the second uh, comment uh, that I'd like to make uh, is uh, on the results of uh, this policy uh, that the ECB uh, was embroiled in. Uh, they played uh, the role of the guardian, uh, uh, the, the centurion standing in front of uh, the uh, banks. And uh, it, this led to unemployment and poverty. It's kept the euro uh, zone at uh, around about zero growth rates, uh, whereas the American economy has now started to get uh, moving and it's uh, uh, showing positive growth uh, rates. Uh, we have had uh, a huge uh, um, widening of uh, social inequality, worse in the South. And uh, in inflation uh, is uh, now going up, and we're supposed to be developing a society. It's the uh, only way of uh, overcoming unemployment. And the third comment I would like uh, to make uh, is uh, the issue of uh, the role of the European Central Bank at the uh, beginning of last year. Uh, the European Central Bank. Uh, was playing a political game uh, by uh, enforcing the asphyxiation of the Greek banks' uh, pol political uh, blackmail uh, against uh, a uh, people who uh, uh, voted against the wishes uh, of the ruling elite and they uh, voted in favour of a left-wing government. And I think if it shows anything, it shows the importance uh, of uh, the uh, social and political links uh, in the outcome of our uh, battles. If we uh, want uh, uh, to uh, fight more battles against the Taliban of liberalism uh, in here in Brussels uh, and in Frankfurt, uh, the left uh, in all countries uh, have to show uh, their strength through their muscles. Uh, the fight uh, of uh, Syriza and the Greek government is not just about Greece, uh, it's also Spain and Ireland and Portugal. These are countries uh, where uh, progressive left-wing parties uh, are becoming stronger. And I think uh, that uh, in a, a European a group such as ours, uh, this is the basic message that we're sending. The stronger we become in each country, uh, uh, the less uh, we are alone in our own countries, uh, and the more likely it is that we will win social battles, uh, and uh, the more efficient our battle will be.